Hi, I'm Femi OK. You're watching the stream. The lead up to the Uganda election in January has been so chaotic, so chaotic and so violent that Uganda is bleeding has it's been a hashtag that has trended on social media. In the next couple of weeks, we want to see what may well happen. So we have guests who will unpack that, what lies ahead for Ugandans between now and January the 14th, which is election day. You've been sending us your tweets. And if you're if you're on YouTube right now, we would love to hear you from you. So all you have need to do is just jump into the comment section and you too can be part of today's program. I am going to say hello to the guests. The guests will say hello to you and introduce themselves. Andrew, it's good to see you. Welcome back to the stream. Remind everybody who you are, what do you do? Femi, I am Andrew Mwenda, the managing director and founder of the Independent Deeper and also old man of the clan. Nice to have you. We also have with us uh, Joel. Joel, please introduce yourself. Tell us who you are. Uh, we're hoping to get Joel back uh, and we'll introduce Joel when he's able to come back. And Rosebell, good to have you. Welcome to the stream. Welcome back to the stream, I should say. Tell everybody and remind them who you are and what you do. Thank you, Femi. Glad to be here. My name is Rosebell Kagumire. I am the editor of African Feminism. Rosebell, I mentioned um, Uganda is bleeding as, as an idea, a campaign, a social media trending hashtag. What does that mean in reality from the last couple of weeks of campaigning in Uganda? Uh, I think we have to go back a few weeks ago, November 18, which was a very dark day in the history of Uganda. Over 50 people were murdered in the city uh, by security forces and we have not had a good idea of um like the reports of the magnitude of the injured uh there were hundreds of people injured so this hashtag really uh, arose out of that dark day and there's not been any plans talking about justice who was behind this accountability so definitely uh, showing that the road towards election on January 14, um, the, there's not going to be much accountability for this kind of acts of uh, um, uh, massacres. That it was a real massacre because uh, there were different people from of different backgrounds. Some people were just walking on the streets and were killed. Some people were just at their workplaces in the building and the soldiers were shooting through the room, the, the windows. So that is really how the hashtag um, arose to, to really bring attention to this magnitude. This was the largest killing uh, in decades in, Kam in, the, in, in Kampala, the capital of the country. So that's where that, that, that's what we have to remember. Andrew, I know you're always very aware of how the world perceives what is going on in Uganda. So when the world hears Uganda is bleeding, how would you explain that? Well, I think that uh, the government has landed itself in uh, a public relations quagmire because it has not been properly organized politically to deal with the challenge of Bobby Wine because it has been almost absent on social media, which is the biggest platform where educated, articulate urban and semi urban youth, semi urban youth participate in the politics and discuss national affairs, it was caught by surprise when so many people rose in riotous anger uh, upon the arrest of Bobby Wine. Because uh, institutions for political mobilization and uh, or political demobilization and counter mobilization had been destroyed, because uh, the government side, the ruling party, is lacking energy and zest or even a faith in what they are doing. Most of the activities that are politically surrendered to the security services. And uh, when you have armies and the police, the ones running your campaign, you are likely to get exactly what we, we saw in November. 
We were hoping to have Joel Sessionyi on, who is the uh, spokesperson for the National Unity Platform. That is a, the party that is headed up by Bobby Wine. I, I'm not sure that we will be able to get him connected to be back onto the program. Uh, but Joel, if you're on Twitter, tweet and we'll bring your tweets into the conversation, just connectivity But issues. I told you, yeah. Femi, that there will be a problem with his line. Didn't I tell you at the beginning? Okay, before we went to there, that's, that's, you. that's high. Highly suspicious of you, Andrew. <laughs> I, I, I will bear this in mind for future times that we ask you to come on to this show. Let me let me take you back, though, joking aside here, to something that's very, okay, very I, serious. I, on, I... on December the 1st, uh, this is the Kayunga district, and um, this is what happened when Bobby Wine took his campaign there. I want you to have a look to see how things unraveled. So there's a tear gas canister that's landing. There are explosions. And then a day after these events, this is when Bobby Wines temporarily suspended his campaign. Mm -hmm. So Andrew was gloating, uh, but here comes Joel. Joel, it's really nice to have you. We, we talked about you, so we're glad that you're happy in the conversation. Joel, introduce yourself to our international audience and then pick up on, on that video that we saw just there. Ah, Joel. Mm. Ah. All right, so uh, uh, bear with us, audience. Uh, it's an important show. We really wanted to get that voice in, but we may not be able to get that voice in. Joel, apologies. Um, Rosebell, um, that scene there, is that typical of a, uh, of a campaign event in Uganda right now? What you saw is not out of the ordinary, to be honest. What we are seeing uh, being done to Bobby Wine's campaign has been done. It was practiced and perfected on Dr. Chisa Besije when he know several times he had come out of jail or he had to be flown to Nairobi for treatment in the middle of the um, um, of the campaigns, uh, this has been perfected elsewhere. So um, in many ways, it's not new. Uh, I think that we have to remember that this kind of violence has been systemic and it's been happening in the country for the last um, over 15 years. So uh, I think what concerns us right now is the sheer um, disorganization, I think, um, that, that Bobby Wine brings in for the regime of President Museveni and the kind of um, people that uh, are drawn in by his campaign kind of building on to the historic, uh, I think, mobilization by people like uh, Dr. Kisa Besti and other opposition parties. So this is on a larger scale, but it's not new. Uh, we, we, we saw gruesome um, violence before, right? Uh, even journalists being, uh, um, uh, being victims of this kind of, of violence. We've seen these images before in Kampala, no doubt. And um, so we, ha we have to root it and to know that it's a systemic issue. It is something that works for the, for the incumbent to, to continue to unleash violence on his opponents and create a very unleveled ground and create an environment of fear. And it's not just about Bobby Wine, because there's there's history between President Museveni and Bobby Wine. It's not just about Bobby Wine. Let me show you why. On here, on my laptop from the Daily Monitor, Mayambala suspends campaigns over brutality, and he is an independent presidential candidate. I have mentioned him several times now, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that his internet connection will be stable. Hello, Joel. Hi, Femi. Uh, I'm hoping you can uh, see me and hear me very loudly. Internet connectivity yeah, here can, can be a problem, and sometimes it's actually very deliberate. I'm hoping it's not in my case, you know, so that our message gets mm -hmm. to be out there. So, yeah, that's my name, Joel Senyuni, spokesperson of NEP. Um, I've followed a bit of the conversation, and um, look, what, what's happening in Uganda is very disturbing, that you have a dictator who has been in power for 34 years now, who does not want any challenge to him? And um, I heard you folks talk about his previous opponents, Dr. Kiza VCJ. And now here we have um, Honorable Chagulanyi Center, Robert, popularly known as Bobby Wine, who has said, I'm going to challenge you, and the people are behind him. And so there goes this violence, you know, 
very high handedness. People are being killed, people are being brutalized, people are in jail. And then some people will say, well, that's the supporters of Bobby Wan and so on, but they're targeting the media too. And I had my sister Rosebell talk about that. They're targeting the media because the media is exposing them. Just last week, our dictatorial government exported, uh, deported journalists, foreign journalists. Why? Because they are exposing the brutality of this regime. So they're causing all this mayhem, wreaking havoc, killing, beating up Ugandans, and they don't want it to go out there, which is very disturbing. Uh, I'm just looking at something here. Well, this is something uh, that Femi, I, and, I think. Yeah, yeah. I Go think ahead, sometimes the mistake we make. Mm, uh, you see, I think that it would be insufficient for us to dichotomize the problem of Uganda as a contest between uh, Devon Seveni and Angel opposition. First, I don't think that the Ugandan political elite have an agreed set of rules around which political contestation for power counted. The absence of that shared basic agreement means that oftentimes each side tries to go through ultra-constitutional means to seek power. You see, if you look at the behavior of security forces, there is some logic you, you will need to notice uh, the logic behind it. And that logic is that uh, the opposition have been saying they have plan B. Elections cannot lead them to power, so they have also a plan B to promote subversion. The security forces, when they intervene, it's not true that they are necessarily dealing with the uh, peaceful politicians, but they are also the political subversives who have uh, an ulterior agenda beyond elections. And they say to themselves, so this that analysis, that, that perspective of the problem. So you can clearly Andrew, see they cannot can even allow me to put in my voice. Andrew, uh, Andrew, hold tight for a moment, just so I can hear, voice. just going to hear Joel, because I can't hear you both Andrew, together. Andrew, you actually jumped in when I was making what I'm saying, saying, saying instead of waiting for Andrew and Joel, Andrew and Joel, I actually, I actually cannot hear you both together. The internet connection is not strong enough for me to hear you both together. Usually I can do that. So I can't today. Can Andrew, I finish, hold tight. Can I finish my point? You can finish a sentence, Andrew. All right. So I was saying that this suspicion on the part of the state, which is also grounded in reality, that the opposition, and not just opposition, but they're also involved in political subversion, leads to the kind of behavior you see with the state. And I think that politics in poor countries where the elite do not have a common agreement. Okay, thanks, Andrew. I'm going over to Joel. Joel, Joel thank to you, Andrew. I'm going over to Joel. Joel, pick up. Go ahead, please. <laughs> You see, the challenge with uh, Museveni propagandists like Andrew Mwenda is that they try to hide the truth under the carpet. So he says that there's no... Andrew Mwenda, we have a constitution in our country. It sets rules that should be played by. You know, our constitution places our army somewhere and not in our elections and all of that. But he says that, you know, we are being brutalized, we are being killed because apparently we might be subversive. How do you explain, Andrew, journalists that are being beaten up. There's many journalists that are in hospitals. Were they being subversive? Majority of the people that are being killed on our streets, you know, these, these are innocent people. There's a young lady that was filming as soldiers were passing by the streets. And as she was filming that, they aimed at her and showed, was she being subversive? So that, that, that's the challenge, that the Muslim propagandists will want to justify his brutality. That no, these people are being beaten because they are subversive and all these different things. Innocent lives are being lost, Andrew. Andrew, when you were still very much in the media, I, active, and uh, a little saying that some people will say, so Joe, you were Joe, a victim. Joe, Joe, hold tight for a moment. I don't want to go into Andrew's history because we don't have time for that. Uh, I want, uh, Rosebell, can you have a look at my laptop here? We asked, and I'm wondering, in, in this debate that's going back and forth, I have, are, uh, are we losing? Uh, are I have we lost losing? voice. Oh, okay, Andrew, we'll, we'll, we'll fix that for you. Hold tight for a moment. Um, Roswell, I am wondering that in all of this back and forth, uh, are we losing? What are the real issues that Ugandans care about heading towards the January election? We asked that and then online, uh, what are the issues that you're looking at? Uh, would you see that he's just trying to survive? Uh, and then a more detailed response from Tamia. Tamia says, good health care, access to education, job creation, a system that is inclusive, that is based on skills, not nepotism, corruption, dictatorship, and tyranny. So that's a, a more uh, in-depth agenda there for what Tamia would 
hope to get for election issues and for politicians to address. Are you seeing politicians addressing this? Are they in their manifestos, Rosebell? Um, I think having a manifesto is one thing, but making these issues articulated in every day uh, becomes difficult if you have a, an opposition politician who is campaigning wearing a, a, um, a bulletproof proof vest to avoid being killed. So somehow, because of the violence, the, unfortunately, the, the casualty is the issues that we should be talking about for the nation, uh, talking about the fact that we have gone through COVID um, and the nation is still going through a, a, an economic crisis triggered by COVID. Uh, millions of people are losing their jobs. They can't afford a meal every day. But this is covered when you have dead bodies on your, on your street because they're being shot. So uh, the issues take a back seat, unfortunately. But these are the issues like Tanya has, has talked about that we should be able to speak out about. Uh, ethnocentrism that Museven's government is, the fact that majority of Ugandans in different parts of the country don't feel that the government uh, represents them genuinely because they don't mm -hmm. see uh, people who look like them uh, carrying out duties on top government uh, bodies. So we need to talk about that. But also, I wanted to say, Andrew, the only person in Uganda who have come to power through unconstitutional means is President Museveni. And we are yet to test our constitution. So I hope that he can give a chance to that. Well, I think the point I want to make here is that uh, there is a way to tell a single story about Uganda. Because during these demonstrations, many of which were right, so remember that many young people set up roadblocks, burnt tires in the middle of the road, attacked supporters of government, looted the property. The role of the government is to ensure law and order. Once you send security forces to ensure law and order, it's very difficult to avoid mistakes. This is not to say that these mistakes are excusable, no. It is simple to say that there are Andrew, inevitable Andrew, consequences you can't have the same, of an you can't have the same policing policies and for 35 years, killing people. That you can't have the same policy reaction towards when people are agitated. You can't go and shoot them point blank. That is not that is not a mistake. It is a it is a systemic response to anything that Ugandans become agitated about. There is this. I, uh, of course, there were some people who were attacking other supporters, but the the reality is that. The people that are attacking those supporters, who is the initiator of, of, of violence? We have massive state-sponsored violence, which is the root cause of all this that we are happening on the streets. I, I yes, am I'm going to interject just for a moment. Just, just, just give me a moment, and I'm doing this not for my own voice, but I'm doing it because we have so many people on YouTube. I'm going to ask you to briefly respond to their questions. Uh, Anis says... Uh, and I'm going to put this to you, Joel. Uh, Wine doesn't have any clear policies because he seems to only focus on telling people that their lives would be better. There's no serious platform for him. Joel, briefly respond to Anise. Anise is on YouTube watching right now. That, that, that's actually not true. Of course, you know, regime propagandists will keep trying to, to paint that image. Um, if they have been attentive, we have been clearly articulating our issues. You know, we keep raising this feast because these five critical issues that we want to talk about, and we've been talking about these things, we're about to sound like broken re a broken record. You know, we're talking about a people-centered government. That's important mm -hmm. for us. You're talking about inclusive economic development. You're talking about our land, our natural resources, getting to be used a lot better than the situation is. The fourth being equal access to quality education and healthcare, all right? Uh, the other issue being international relations. We, we have quite a challenge with that, um, and of course our national security. So these are part of our manifesto, which we have been putting out there uh, for those that care to listen, but some clearly keep diverting us. You know, but, mm -hmm. but I wanted to say this. Um, I Stephen have another Stephen question, and, I, and I, I, I wanted to share this right. with our audience on YouTube. I, I know you know that that's an important audience, particularly for you. If they're on social media, I know that's an important audience for you. Sophia B., sure. uh, what changes will Museveni make if he is re-elected? In the 34 years that he has been there, Uganda has not appeared to progress. Even if Bobby is unqualified, isn't change needed? Andrew, I'm not going to expect you to jump into the head of President Museveni, but that idea about change needed. Uh, 34 years and then and then more coming up for next year? How would you respond to, to Sophia Femi, First of all, on if YouTube? there is anybody who wants a change in the president of Uganda, I am number one. Nobody can lead me on that. Where I disagree <laughs> is to say that any change that is uh, 
that any change is required, uh, rather is good change. That is one. The second thing, Femi, is that it's not true that Uganda has not progressed. If you look at Bloomberg News right now, they have put a, a list of the five best, the ten best performing economies in the world. Uganda is number two in the world, uh, rather number five in the world, number two in Africa. Uganda has sustained an impressive rate of economic growth over the last 35 years. We should not deny the truth. It has been the 11th fastest growing economy in the world period of 35 years. Its record in terms of GDP growth, per capita income growth, expansion of welfare, is among the best that has been recorded historically. The opposition mm. wants to deny I, this reality I, I because they just don't understand economics. Please, oh let me first finish. Goodness. They don't understand economics. There is a great uh, book that has, Andrew, been, uh, that has been published. Andrew, your, your, your co-guest. Your co guests yes. have something to say, but Andrew, Andrew Rosebell briefly. Cannot, Go ahead. You cannot say, Andrew, you cannot Andrew, say you understand it's economics not better about, than an ordinary cannot, class. All right, I'll let Rosebell. Andrew, you cannot measure a uh, societal uh, transformation just by looking at GDP and growth. It's about who is growing. Is it Museveni and his cronies? Is it people um, around a certain small, tight-held private sector that serves the president and his family and his clan? Who is growing? Who is being left behind? Unfortunately, this growth has happened at a, a, a magnitude that also correlates to a big gap in inequality. Many Ugandans, for so every Ugandan that goes out of poverty, two fall back. So we know that that is also on record. Here, first of all, first of all, everything you have said, everything you have said, everything you have said is not, uh, uh, is not true. One. First. Yes. It's yes, true because you look at all indicators. Done, hold tight a moment because I literally cannot hear you. I, I'm going to take a pause because we're almost at the end of the show. But I want to bring in Safina. And Safina, we've been talking about violence. We've been talking about um, uh, political manifestos. We've been talking about different campaigns. Uh, but Safina has, has one idea for how Uganda moves forward. And um, this is what she told us earlier. Have a listen. Make this a protest vote. That has been my one's message ever since the massacre happened last month, ever since those people were murdered in the streets. So this is how we take a stand for them. This is how we fight for them, by turning out to vote and getting our vote. And the regime knows that the more people that turn out to vote, the harder it's going to be for them to rig. That's why they've been um, investing in voter apathy over the years. And this year, they disenfranchised over 1 million teenagers who were turning 18, and they prevented them from registering to vote. So ahead of this show, we did a very unscientific stream poll, and we said, Uganda decides 2021. Who do you think will win the 2021 presidential election? This is unscientific. President Yoweri Museveni gets 30%. Bobby Ryan gets 69% in our very unscientific poll. Uh, underneath comments here, Uganda will decide to vote for Bobby Wine, but Museveni will just win. Lots of cynics in the stream online community. Kwasi, seriously, I mean, are you very seriously asking this question? Talk about something else. Uh, Cedric, this is not a question to ask. Museveni will never let go of his presidency. You can look underneath that tweet that's on at AJ Stream to see more of those responses. Let me go back to Rosebell. Rosebell, this idea about the, uh, can there be a free and fair election on January the 14th? Will the person who gets the most votes actually become president? Is that possible in Uganda today? From where I stand, it is almost impossible because we have been to the polls uh, for the last five times. Uh, I have voted in most of the elections since I turned 18. And these elections, some of them, the courts of law have said they were not free and fair. We have seen the last election 2016, the military was deployed, the opposition leader was put under house arrest to to, to control any kind of uh, response to, to the election. So we, we have known for a long time that we don't have an impartial electoral commission. And the process is not free and fair from the campaigning to right to the county. So I'm wondering actually to mm. ask uh, someone like Joe, what pushes you every we're, day? You know, it's incredible yeah. for me. Like, what we're push we're, right, to we're think right at the end win. of the show. Rosebell, we're, we're right at yeah, the so end of the show. So that's that. a, that's I, I just a... wanted to say, sure, I just wanted to say yeah, that. Joe, I've Andrew got 30 says, seconds, so you have to answer it in 30 seconds. Can you do that? Very important for me to say this. When Andrew says Ugandans don't understand economics, I'm thinking, are you kidding me? They do understand economics when they don't have pocket money in their pockets, when they're unemployed, when they see 
Joe, instead of our health care and, and all Andrew, of that. But anyhow, getting to, getting to why Thank we... Thank you so very much. much. We are now at the it's end of the program. Like but head over here, here to my laptop. You know, the conversation hasn't ended yet. Head over here to my laptop. Let me show you that we will take Rose Bell to Instagram Live at 2030 GMT to continue the conversation there. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you next time.